Hello, I'm Professor Afshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 103, Lecture 33. In this lecture, we'll discuss thin film interference. This topic is covered in Chapter 37 of our textbook by Survey and Jobet. Over the last couple of lectures, we've been discussing the interference of light. Light waves, like other kinds of waves, such as water waves and sound waves, experience constructive, partial, and destructive interference. However, because light waves are visible to our eyes, we often see this interference in spectacular ways. One example of that is when light rays reflect from thin films, and that's the topic of today's lecture, thin film interference. Before talking about thin films, though, we need to talk about the reflection of light and how its phase changes upon reflection. So consider a beam of light reflecting from the boundary between two media. We have medium one with index n1 and a second medium with index n2. To begin with, we'll assume that the index of uh, medium one is less than the index of medium two. So here we're imagining, for example, air and glass. The index of refraction of air is approximately 1, and for a typical piece of glass, the index is 1.5. So we have a situation where the first medium has a lower index than the second medium. When light reaches this boundary, some of it is transmitted and refracted. We're not interested in that portion right now. We're interested in the portion that is reflected. It turns out the light that is reflected experiences a phase change. So we say that the phase constant of the reflected beam is equal to whatever the phase constant of the incident beam was plus pi radians. This situation should remind you of what happens when a rope wave, for example, reaches the end of the line, so to speak. If the end of the line is a fixed point, so a node, then that wave reflects, but when it reflects, it's flipped upside down. This flipping of the wave is what we're describing as a phase change of pi radians. Of course, the opposite could happen too. We could have light going from glass to air, for example. You could imagine going under water, for example, and shining a flashlight or a laser beam upwards at the boundary between air and water, and then a slightly different thing happens. Once again, light will reflect from that boundary, but this time, when n1 is greater than n2, there is no phase change. So we say that the phase constant of the reflected beam is equal to the phase constant of the incident beam. This should remind you of a rope wave when one end of the rope is free. So if this end, the right end of this rope, is an anti-node, then the wave reaches the end and it reflects, and the reflected rope wave looks exactly like the incident rope wave. It's upright, it's not inverted, so we say that the phase constant is the same. Also recall that in general, sine of theta plus pi is equal to minus sine of theta. So this is just a fact from geometry. And so when I say a wave is inverted or flipped upside down, what I'm saying essentially is that the uh, function is multiplied by a negative one. And here we want to describe that by a phase change of pi. It turns out this is a more convenient way of describing a wave that is inverted. So when I say the phase constant does not change, I'm basically saying that the wave is not flipped upside down. And when I say the phase constant changes by pi radians, I'm basically saying the wave is flipped upside down or it's inverted upon reflection. Notice whether we have a phase change or not depends on n1 and n2. In particular, depends on which one of those is bigger and which is smaller. So to better understand the reflection of light, let's consider the two possible scenarios side by side. On the left, light comes from medium one and is transmitted into medium two. On the left, we're assuming that N2 is greater than N1. 
On the right, a similar thing is happening, but here we're assuming that n2 is less than n1. In both cases, we're talking about the normal incidence of light. What that means is that the incident beam is normal or perpendicular to the boundary. We would say that the angle of incidence is zero degrees. Some of the light is transmitted into the second medium and some of the light is reflected. For our discussion of thin film interference, we're really interested in what happens to the reflected light, but it's worthwhile thinking about the transmitted light for a few seconds as well. The light that is transmitted into the second medium changes its speed and it also changes its wavelength. Recall that wavelength, speed, and the index of refraction are all related. So for example, in medium one, we could say the index is equal to the speed of light in vacuum divided by the speed of light in medium one. N2 is going to be the speed of light in vacuum divided by the speed of light in medium two. We can also say that in medium one, the speed of light is equal to the frequency times the wavelength in medium one and the speed of light in medium two is equal to the frequency times the wavelength in medium two. Notice the wavelength is changing, but the frequency does not change. So as waves propagate from one medium to the next, the frequency remains the same, but other things can change. For example, the speed can change and the wavelength can change. If N2 is bigger than N1, then light is basically slowing down as it goes into the second medium, so we can say V2 is less than V1. If V2 is less than V1 and the frequencies are the same, then lambda 2 must be less than lambda 1. The exact opposite happens in, on the right-hand side because on the right side, we're assuming a scenario in which N2 is less than N1. Now, as I mentioned for thin film interference, what matters is the reflected beam. So we need to focus on the reflected beams that are shown here. As I explained on the previous slide, when N2 is greater than N1, the reflected beam experiences a phase change. The reflected beam is inverted or flipped upside down. And we describe that by saying that the phase of the wave has changed by pi radians. Notice in this picture, the incident beam is flipped to give us the reflected beam. So that flipping or inversion is described by a phase constant of pi radians. On the right-hand side, where N2 is less than N1, there is no phase change. So as I explained on the previous slide, the reflected beam is basically reflected the same way that it came in. So there is no inversion and the phase change is zero. So as you can see, the incident beam and the reflected beam look identical in this picture. It turns out the exact nature of the reflected beam is going to be very important for us because how the beam is reflecting from the boundary determines properties of the thin film, as we will soon see. When discussing thin film interference in this class, we're almost always interested in normal incidence. In other words, in almost all of the problems that you'll see in this class involving thin film interference, the angle of incidence will be zero degrees. Nonetheless, thin film interference can also be observed with non-normal incidence, so it might be helpful to see some examples where the incident beam does not have an angle of zero degrees. So here we're again considering the two possible scenarios, but the angle of incidence is clearly not zero degrees. We have an incoming beam, the incident beam, we have a reflected beam, and then we have a transmitted beam. On the left, N2 is greater than N1. On the right, N2 is less than N1. In both cases, as you can see, the transmitted beam changes its direction of propagation. We describe this sometimes by saying that the light is bending or that there is refraction. If we wanted to, we could calculate the angle of refraction. If we know theta one in both of these cases, 
and we know the indices of refraction, then using Snell's law, we can calculate theta 2 in either of these two scenarios. However, when it comes to thin film interference, we're not really interested in the transmitted beam. What we're primarily interested in is the reflected beam. Notice that the reflected beam behaves differently in the two cases. On the left, the reflected beam is not just a continuation of the incident beam, it experiences a phase change of pi radians. On the right, the reflected beam is really just a continuation of the incident beam, so we say that there is no phase change or that there is a phase change of zero radians. You can see that a little bit better if you take the incident beam and the reflected beam and in a sense straighten them out so that one becomes a continuation of the other. So if you take the two beams and straighten them out, you'll see that the reflected beam is really just a continuation of the incident beam. So here on the left, I've drawn the incident beam and on the right, I've drawn the reflected beam. And you can see at this point where the two beams are joined at the origin, one is simply a continuation of the other one. So we say there is no phase change. In this scenario on the left, the picture is going to be a little bit different. As you can see, what's happening at the boundary is a little bit different. The wave isn't just a continuation. It looks something like this. There is a point here at the boundary where the function is non-differentiable. So we describe that as an inversion, or more precisely, we say that the reflected beam experience, experiences a phase change of pi radians. The details of exactly how all of this happens at the boundary isn't important for us. For us, if we want to understand properties of thin films, what's important is that sometimes there is an inversion, so there is a phase shift, and sometimes there is no phase shift. So you might be wondering why the reflection of light from a boundary is so important. Why are we spending so much time studying that reflected beam? Well, the reason is that two reflected beams of light can interfere with one another. We've seen many examples of interference up until now, but usually we've been talking about two distinct sources of light interfering with one another. It turns out in situations where you have two or more reflected rays, those reflected rays can interfere constructively or destructively with each other, even though they both originated from a single source. This type of a thing happens most often when you have a thin film. So the typical scenario is depicted here. We have three media, we can call the top one medium one, medium two, and medium three. Medium one and medium three are usually the same medium and they are usually air, although that doesn't have to be the case. Medium one and medium three are separated by medium two and medium two is usually a relatively thin material having some thickness t. Because the thickness is usually a small number, we describe this kind of a situation as a thin film situation. Now consider what happens when a single beam of light is incident on the thin film. The incoming ray encounters the boundary between medium one and medium two. At that boundary, some of the light is reflected, we'll call that beam one, and then of course some is transmitted, it passes through the second medium, and then it encounters the second boundary. At the second boundary, as usual, some of the light is transmitted, we're calling that beam three, and then some of the light is reflected back towards ba the first boundary. When that beam encounters the first boundary, again, some of the light is transmitted, we're calling that beam two, and some of the light, of course, is reflected and stays inside the thin film. You can imagine that this process can continue for a very long time. So when we arrive back at the second boundary, again, some of the light is reflected and some of the light is transmitted. We're calling the transmitted portion four, 
And then, of course, when this beam arrives at the first boundary, again, some of it is transmitted and some of it is reflected. So this process of reflecting and transmitting can happen many, many times, but of course the intensity of the light is diminished with every reflection. Every time we lose some of the light energy, so the light basically becomes less and less bright, and after essentially the second reflection, you usually cannot see the beams. So in this context, we almost always consider only two reflections of light and we ignore the subsequent reflections. So now think about what happens if you are an observer looking at this situation from the outside. What happens when beams one and two end up in the eye of the observer? Depending on the relative phase of two and one, you could have constructive interference, in which case the observer would see a bright light, or destructive interference, in which case the observer would see a dim light. It turns out this type of interference between reflected beams has many applications. Anti-reflective coatings are one of the most important applications of thin films. Camera lenses are often reflected, uh, are often covered or coated with anti-reflective coatings because we often want to uh, minimize or maximize the reflection of certain wavelengths from the camera lens. Anti-reflective coatings are also sometimes applied to glasses. If there is no anti-reflective coating, then we often see a lot of reflection that's often seen as glare, which obstructs the eyes of the person wearing those glasses. But if the glasses are covered with anti-reflective coating, then through destructive interference, we can eliminate the reflection, and then we can see just the transmitted light, the light that is coming from the eye of the wearer to the eye of the observer. Solar panels are also covered with anti-reflective coating. Solar panels essentially take sunlight and convert it to electric energy. For that process to be efficient, we would like all of the sunlight to be transmitted through to the solar panel, and none of it should be reflected, ideally. So we can use anti-reflective coatings to minimize the reflection. This phenomenon also happens naturally. For example, with soap bubbles, you may have noticed that even though a soap bubble is illuminated with white light, which includes all colors, only certain colors are reflected strongly from the soap bubble. In this example, we can see, for example, blue and red and yellow prominently, but we cannot see green. Why is that? Well, the reason is that the green wavelengths are experiencing destructive interference. They're being canceled essentially, so we don't see them, but the blue wavelengths are experiencing constructive interference, so we can see them very prominently. So for the rest of this lecture, our goal is to understand this process in detail. Our goal is to understand exactly what the phase difference between beam one and beam two is, and based on that difference in total phase, we want to determine when we get constructive interference and when we get destructive interference. So let's examine the thin film situation in a lot more detail now. Here we have three media with indices N1, N2, and N3. As I mentioned before, the first medium and the third medium are usually the same medium, and they are usually air, but that does not have to be the case. We have an incident beam of light coming in. In this case, we're imagining that the angle of incidence is zero. As I mentioned before, most of the cases we're interested in are normal incidence. When the beam encounters the boundary between the first medium and the second medium, some of it is transmitted, which is shown here as the green wave, and then some of it is reflected. I've shown the reflected beam on the side so that you don't confuse the incident beam and the reflected beam. I'm calling the reflected beam beam one. Now what happens to the transmitted beam? Well, the transmitted beam simply passes through the second medium and it encounters the second boundary. The second boundary separates medium two from medium three. 
What it encounters is that second boundary, some of it, as usual, is transmitted, and then some of it is reflected. I've shown the reflected beam here on the side, so you don't confuse the reflection and the incidence. Now, the reflected beam travels back through the second medium, and it encounters the first boundary one more time. Again, some of the light can be reflected. I have not shown that here. And some of the light, of course, is transmitted. I'm calling that transmitted beam, beam two. If there happened to be a light detector or an observer out here looking at this situation, when beams one and two end up in the eye of the observer, they can interfere with one another constructively or destructively. We'd like to know exactly what the phase difference is so we can determine what type of interference we have. Recall that interference depends on the difference between the total phases. So what we need to figure out is the total phase for beam 2, the total phase for beam 1. Look at the difference. If we get an even pi, then we have constructive interference. If we get an odd pi, then we get destructive interference. Recall that the total phase is really kr minus omega t plus phi. If we're talking about the total phase for beam 2, then we should talk about the distance that beam 2 travels and the phase constants for beam 2. And we should subtract from that the total phase for beam 1. Beam 1 could have its own phase constant and it will be traveling its own distance. We're going to um, leave omega and k essentially alone because the two waves will have the same wavelength and the same frequency. Now, when you calculate this difference, what you get is k times r2 minus r1. We can call that delta r plus phi2 minus phi1. Phi1 and phi2 basically depend on whether there is an inversion or not. Recall that we're talking about two reflections. So the first reflection happens here and the second reflection happens here. Depending on the relative values of n1, n2, n3, sometimes we get an inversion, sometimes we don't get an inversion. So phi1 and phi2 depend on the precise numerical values for n2, n3, and also n1. What about R2 minus R1? Well, this turns out to be simply twice the thickness of the thin film, right? Notice that one of the beams, beam one, immediately reflects at this point here, but the second beam has to travel once through the film and then back again. The total extra distance that it travels is twice the thickness of the film, so we can say R2 minus R1 is simply 2t. And of course, recall that k is really 2 pi over the wavelength. So this whole thing can be simplified considerably. We can say that the total phase difference between the two beams is 2 pi over the wavelength times 2t, which is the difference in path length, plus the phase change for reflection at the second boundary minus the phase change for reflection at the first boundary. Once we calculate all this, if this equals to some even number of pi's, we have constructive interference. If it equals to some odd number of pi's, then we have a destructive interference. So to summarize the situation, this is what we have. We have essentially three possible outcomes. When beams one and two interfere, we could have partial interference, which is not very interesting. We could have constructive interference or destructive interference. We're primarily interested in those two extreme cases. Constructive interference, of course, for normal incidents, happens when the difference in total phase is an even number of pi radians. We found that delta phi is given by this expression here. And by rearranging this expression a little bit, we find that we get constructive interference whenever twice the thickness of the film divided by the wavelength is equal to this quantity here. In this expression, m incidentally is just an integer. We're not using the letter n anymore because in the context of optics, 
n is used for the refractive index. So here just think of m essentially as 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Technically, these could be plus or minus integers. We can also have destructive interference. We know that for destructive interference, uh, delta phi is an odd pi. We know delta phi is given by this expression here and by manipulating this expression here a little bit, we find that we get destructive interference when twice the thickness of the film divided by lambda is equal to this expression here. Now notice a subtlety in all of these equations. These equations express everything in terms of lambda 2. Lambda 2 is the wavelength of light in the thin film, in the second medium. Usually, however, the observer is not in the second medium, is in the first medium. The first medium is usually air, and the detector or the person watching the situation is in air. So what we're often interested in is not lambda 2, but lambda 1. Of course, lambda 2 and lambda 1 are related. We can say that lambda 2 is equal to n1 over n2 times lambda 1. So this expression allows you to figure out the thickness or lambda 2. Just remember that in most practical situations, you have to do one more calculation to calculate lambda 1. As I've already mentioned several times in this class, when we're discussing thin film interference, we're always interested in normal incidence. So we will assume that the angle of incidence onto the thin film is 0 degrees. However, that doesn't have to be the case, and it might be helpful for you to see the more general case. The more general case is depicted here. We have some beam coming in at some initial angle theta 1. That's the angle of incidence. Some of it is transmitted, and some of it is reflected. The reflected beam is referred to as beam 1. The beam that is transmitted can also be reflected from the second boundary, it travels back towards the first boundary and then it is transmitted, that's beam 2. Beam 1 and beam 2 can interfere with each other. The type of interference that we get depends on the difference in the total phase. In this case, the difference in total phase, of course, depends on whether there is an inversion at the two reflection points. So this is phi for the first reflection here, and this is phi for the second reflection down here. These two numbers are either 0 or pi, which it is depends on the relative value of n1, n2, and n3. Of course, the beam that is transmitted and travels through the thin film has to travel a longer distance. We can calculate the longer distance. It's no longer just twice the thickness, because as you can see, the beam is traveling at an angle. With some geometry, you can convince yourself that the extra distance is 2t times cosine of theta 2. And so the total phase ends up being essentially this more complicated expression here. As before, once you've calculated this delta phi, if it's an even pi, you have constructive interference. If it's an odd pi, you have destructive interference. However, as I mentioned before, n1 is usually 1 because n1 is usually air, and theta1 is usually 0 degrees because we like to consider normal incidence, and therefore theta2 is usually 0 degrees. Okay, let's end this lecture with a somewhat challenging practice problem. Suppose a thin film is viewed at normal incidence from air, and of course the index of refraction for air is usually taken to be 1. The thin film has refractive index of 1.5 and a thickness of 350 nanometers. It is deposited over a substrate with index of 1.3. So the substrate is basically the third medium in this problem. When illuminated with white light, which colors are reflected most prominently? So the situation is depicted here. As usual, we have medium 1, medium 2, medium 3. Medium 1 is air, and its index is 1. Medium 2 is the thin film that we're interested in. Its thickness is given to us as 350 nanometers, and its index is 
The thin film is coating a substrate, so it's deposited on top of some other material, perhaps the glass of a camera lens, and the index of refraction for the third medium is also given to us as 1.3. We know that some light is going to come in, some of it is going to be reflected, some is going to be transmitted, there's going to be a second reflection, that second reflection will eventually come out of the thin film and then interfere with the first one. The type of interference that we get, of course, depends on the thickness and also uh, the phase changes that the reflections experience. To begin with, let's calculate the phase changes that are experienced when there is a reflection. We know that when N1 is greater than N2, there is no inversion or phase change. When N1 is less than N2, there is an inversion or a phase change of pi radians. Now we need to apply this formula basically twice to both of the boundaries. So we'll apply it once here and we'll apply it again over here. For the first reflection, we have N1, which is equal to one, and N2, which is equal to 1.5. Clearly, N1 is less than N2, so we're going to get a phase change of pi radians. So we say that the phase after the first reflection is pi radians. There's a second reflection that happens here. The index of refraction of the first medium now is going to be 1.5, and for the second medium, it's going to be 1.3. Notice that when I say first medium and second medium, I'm focusing on this reflection here, and I'm thinking of the initial medium and the final medium. Here, N1 is greater than N2, so we now say that the phase change must be zero radians, so that the um, phase constant for reflection from the second boundary is just zero. Now that we know what the phase changes are due to reflection, we can now calculate the total phase. So the total phase difference is going to be basically the path length difference, which is 2t times k, which is 2 pi over lambda, plus the phase change for the second reflection minus the phase change for the first reflection. So that's 2 pi times 2t over lambda plus 0 minus pi. All of that simplifies to 4 pi t over lambda 2 minus pi. So this is going to be the total phase difference between these two beams. Now the question is, what wavelengths are going to be seen most prominently? Note that the substrate is illuminated with white light, which means that there are all kinds of wavelengths, essentially all colors, that are incident on this thin film. And all of those are going to be reflected, but upon reflection, some are going to disappear because they will interfere destructively, and some are going to be accentuated. Some are going to be seen much more clearly because they experience constructive interference. So we now need to know which wavelengths are the ones that essentially experience destructive interference and which ones experience constructive interference. So we can summarize the problem so far by saying that there are three media, the indices are given to us. The second medium, the one in the middle, the thin film, has a thickness of 350 nanometers. The most prominent colors, the ones that are most visible when you look at the situation, are the ones that experience constructive interference. The ones that experience destructive interference are essentially invisible from the point of view of someone outside looking at those reflections. On the previous slide, we found that the phase difference is 4 pi t over lambda minus pi, and we're now going to set that equal to even pi. Notice that m in this context is simply an integer, so you can think of m as 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. So now we can use this expression here to solve for lambda 2, for the wavelength. By rearranging this equation here, we find that wavelength is equal to 4 pi t divided by 2 m pi plus pi. 
You can obviously simplify this expression a little bit. You can cancel the pi's here. And what you get is 4t over 2m plus 1. Recall that m is basically the integers, so it could be 0 or 1 or 2 or 3 and so on. So plug in different values for m. When you plug in 0, you will find that the wavelength is equal to 1400 nanometers. When you plug in 1, the wavelength is approximately 467 nanometers. When you plug in 2, the wavelength is going to be 280 nanometers and then 200 nanometers and so on. Now notice that what I have calculated here is the wavelength for which we have constructive interference, but this is wavelength in medium two. The observer is looking from the outside in medium one. So what we're really interested in uh, is what lambda one is. We know that lambda one and lambda two are related to each other. In particular, lambda one is equal to N two over N one times lambda two. We know what n1 and n2 are. We've just calculated a string of lambda 2s, so we can now plug those in and find that the wavelengths that are most prominently seen out in medium 1 in air are the following wavelengths, 2100 nanometers, 700 nanometers, 420 nanometers, and 300 nanometers. So if you are looking at this thin film, the colors or the wavelength that you will see most prominently are these. The question specifically asks for which colors are going to be seen. So we now need a table that tells us what colors correspond to various wavelengths. As you look at these values and compare them to the numbers that are in this table, you can see that the colors that are going to be most visible, the colors that are most strongly reflected from this thin film are going to be red and violet. There will also be some other wavelengths, but those wavelengths are not within the range um, of human vision. So, for example, the wavelength of 2100 nanometers is simply too long for the human eye to see, and the wavelength of 300 nanometers is just generally too short for the human eye to see. So when you look at this particular film, it will mostly look red and violet, and other colors like yellow and green are going to be missing from the reflections. And that is the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.